Good morning. So my name is Mohammed Nandabai, I'm from Al Jazeera. Just uh, before I start, um, can you just guys give me a show of hands for who's heard of Al Jazeera before? Great, that's most of you. And how many of you have actually watched Al Jazeera? Okay, so probably half. Um, so one of the things that I try to do is to try to give more people access to Al Jazeera so people can see it. A lot being spoken about us and a lot of people talk about who we are. Um, but not that many people have actually seen us. So, I don't want to get too much into the PR thing because that's not what I'm here to speak about and I've got my colleagues from the PR section here. But I just want to give you the scale of our business and what we do. Um, obviously, we're a news broadcaster primarily. We have two um, international news stations, an Arabic 24-hour station and an English 24-hour station. We've also got three sports channels, a documentary channel, um, a children's channel, um, a live C-SPAN channel that covers live events, training center, um, and research center. Um, you know, and this encompasses about 3,000 people in over 62 locations across the world. So we're quite a big organization, um, and big, a big broadcaster. And I just want to keep that in the back of your minds um, when I start talking about some of the challenges we've had um, trying to make some of our content free and trying to open it up a bit. And normally, um, my job is to explain to people in suits um, what new media is and how everything going online is changing things. So today I'm in an awkward situation because I'm explaining to people what I normally try to explain to the other side. Um, because you guys create all this great work and are pioneers in your fields. And so I'm speaking back to you rather than the other way around. So I hope you bear with me. Now, our business is a media company and as a news organization. Um, it's a really exciting time because everything is changing. Uh, this is Rupert Murdoch, maybe some of you have heard of him. But he's one of the great media titans that he owns. Um, big media properties from Australia to America. And you know, if you just read what he's saying, that to find something comparable to the moment we're in now, you have to go back 500 years to when the printing press was invented. Um, and the power is now shifting, it's shifting to the people, shifting away from the editors, um, the publishers, the media elite, the establishment. And when he says this, everyone stands up and takes notice because he is the establishment. Um, and he recognizes that this change is taking place. And this change, um, is so critical to what we do, so critical to our industry, um, that we can't ignore it. Um, and it's so important to keep as well that uh, Fox um, put down $2 billion the last time I checked, and they bought MySpace with their fund, with part of their fund. So they're really engaging it. So some of the challenges our industry is facing, um, and these are just a few of them, is number one, we're losing audiences to new platforms. And this is important because people are going online, whether it's to YouTube, or whether they're getting onto the Xboxes and play games. These are traditional audiences that media companies had, and now they're getting segmented and they're going into different platforms and different places. Even worse than this, new audiences who are just you know, beginning to grow up are now not just sitting in front of the TV and watching the way they were previously, and not watching broadcast television. Um, number two, there's new content creators and sources. Just people are creating content, you know. Um, everybody's got a mobile phone and it's got a 5 megapixel camera and you can go to create video and upload it straight to YouTube and go to straight to Flickr and write your blog post and tag it and it's online. So all these new sources and new content is being created out there. Um, Thirdly, content is going online whether we like it or not. Um, you know, whether this is something, you know, the music industry faces this issue, every industry is facing it now, the film industry is facing it, we're facing it. Your content is going to be online even if you don't put it there. <coughs> Somebody else is going to put it there. And uh, possibly the business model is not defined. We don't you know, we have the right economic models of how we make money of this, um, what this means, it's still changing, people are trying to figure out where you go from here. Do we put up a, our content there, pay wall, do we make it free, is advertising, is advertising sustainable in the long run, how exactly does this work, what happens to our print operation. Um, so no one's really figured this out, and I think it's just a process that's ongoing. And you know, lastly, there's resistance to change, and I think in any industry, in any business, that um, people don't, I mean, you know, it's not clear what's going on and people are trying to resist this change. And all of this leads to what I think is a crisis of relevance. The people in our industry are really trying to figure out what their role is and what their job is within this current climate. And, you know, this manifests itself, you know, with Viacom um, suing YouTube, with, you know, the AP takedown notices to the judge report, um, you know, jobs being slashed, foreign bureaus being closed. So companies are really trying to think when media becomes so disintermediated and when you get a source of material, when we, somebody creates a report 
and the time it gets to the consumer, it might have changed so much along the way, or might have come through various different channels. It's not direct anymore. It's not straight broadcast from me to you. Um, this really, what are you doing? You need to ask what's your role as a broadcaster, or what's your role um, as a newspaper. And I love this cartoon because it really catches um, this whole crisis. You know, when the kid says, Dad, you hear the news, and he says, no, I haven't watched CNN. And the kid goes, what's CNN? Because news can be so disintermediated where the news may have come from CNN or Al Jazeera or Global Voices or wherever it is, but by the time it gets to the person who's going to watch it, he, you know, he doesn't know where that source may have come from. You know, he might have get some Google News, through a friend's blog post who was quoting it, um, and some various other um, means. So what happens when, you're, when what you've created, the way it ends up are different? And this is something we're trying to figure out. What does this mean to us in the industry? Um, and as well with this new generation, you know, um, people under 30, everything's changed well in terms of how we consume media and how we think of media. Um, you know, we now create and share our own media. This didn't happen, you know, to our parents. Um, the lines between public and private, private are blurred. You know, my dad thinks I'm crazy when, we, you know, if someone takes my photo and puts it online because there's this very um, clear understanding of what's private and what's not. Um, you know, we have unbelievable choice. We all socially network, we're connected to each other, connected to information all the time. And our reference point for trust is changing. So then how do we begin to deal with all of this? Um, you know, this, this picture, the picture on the right hand side um, of these guys sitting in this coffee shop watching Al Jazeera is typically, you know, how Al Jazeera was bought. It was very communal, people would sit in coffee houses um, watching the news um, in, in cafes in Cairo and Amman. And now we're dealing with a new generation where people are sitting forward at their PCs consuming media. And this shift is important to figure out where do we move and how do we deal with this. So, uh, one of the things that I do at Zero um, is I need a really talented team that's trying to understand this phenomena and trying to create products around it to deal with it. Um, and you know, just to put this to the side, there's a few of the public projects. You know, they're all things which you know, the youth are flocking to, and we flock to as well. You know, whether it's on the iPhone or YouTube or Facebook um, or podcasting. So it's really to ask the question, how would we like to consume media and how would um, you know, people in schools and universities like to consume media and can we provide it to them? And the way we understood this model was this is a traditional broadcast model. We broadcast something, it goes out onto your TV. Then we moved to a form of distributed distribution where it wasn't just a television set anymore. It could have been your iPod, it could be um, onto an RSS feed, to your mobile phone, onto YouTube, Facebook, blogs, and whatever else comes next. But, you know, so we've done that, you know, and most people have done that now. You can get content in over all these different platforms. But after this, what do you do? And for us, really, it's how you move towards this participatory culture, where now everyone's creating. And where your inputs are, are now different. It's not just your reporters going out and creating uh, content, but people are creating content everywhere. And how do you try to integrate this into your new cycle? And this cycle becomes very important because you might get information from somebody who's created it on the web or, or mobile, and then you broadcast it out, but then it goes off to these multiple different delivery platforms. And then someone will take what you've delivered and then remix it, and it will get fed back to you. So you end up with a cycle of content just being created on top of other content. Um, and this is why you know, licensing is so interesting for us, because how do we enable this um, in a way that we respect everybody's rights when we're creating this content? So, I'm just going to talk a bit about how we as an organization have started to think about free. This is Chris Anderson's you know, article about a month or two ago talking about free as a new business model. Um, and really, why we started thinking about free and how we started to get buying in the organization um, slowly and, and what those steps were. So, first thing when we start talking about free, um, there's three good reasons for why you're doing it. You can't just do it for the sake of doing it. Philosophically, I might believe in the comments. But that's not a good enough business reason for the other thousands of people in my organization. Um, so when we initially conceptualized this, we came up with a number of points. The first thing is reputation for the organization. Al Jazeera has always been seen as a pioneering um, news company that we go where other people wouldn't have gone, um, that we do the hard reporting. And really, you know, for us, it's, there's, there's a, the benefit to our reputation is seen as pioneering online media reform. And if we can be um, really pushing the boundaries in what we do. Secondly, there's distribution. Um, you know, we want to reach a bigger audience. Um, we, with our English channel, there's new markets where we want to break into. Um, you know, our, our, 
you know, the, the people we are obviously taking on these markets and our peers and competitors are CNN and PDC. So how do we get into those markets and how do we get distribution into these markets? Um, third is financial, you know, uh, eventually, um, at least the way we track the position, and this hasn't necessarily worn itself out yet, is that you can create financial value um, out of making your content freely available. Whether that's through increasing viewership, which could be increasing advertising revenue, whether it's, um, you know, making it freely available to the public and, you know, more broadcasters see it, which means they might rebroadcast it, which means you're taking a royalty of them. Um, so there's different models that we're exploring here. Um, first thing is community empowerment. We want to be able to give back to the community. We, you know, we creators, at the end of the day, we create content. We want other creators to be able to benefit from this. Um, and this comes down to something that's key to our own organization's charter, which is to respect our audience. If our audience is looking for it online, we're not going to treat them as criminals, um, because why are you watching it here, you should be watching it on the satellite or over cable. Um, so it's really trying to respect them and understand them and cater for them. And finally, to challenge our competitors and challenge other people in the industry to say, this is what's possible, uh, we can do this, and you need to start thinking about it. Even if you don't do it, at least you're going to say, hey, look, they did it, let's think about it, and let's see if it's something we can start um, doing. So, our experience in trying to make some of our content free, um, so the first, I'm just going to run through these points and I'll explain each of them. First of all, you don't set out to do it for philosophical reasons, or you don't set it for it. Um, you do it to get it done. And this is especially important in business. Um, secondly, you start small and create a precedent for what you do. Then you need to get buy from your senior management. You align it to your corporate and business objectives. You prove those strategic objectives that you've met them, and then you just keep on going. So, uh, yesterday, Joy was showing up for free beer, and uh, he asked, you know, who knows what this is. And this is Richard Stallman, where I believe the term originated was in free as in speech and not free as, free as in beer. And while, you know, I think everybody deeply respects Richard Stallman, um, I know I do, you know, when he talks about, you know, when we talk about free software um, by the name, you know, it gives you the same freedom, but the word which you use is important because, you know, it conveys that idea. Yeah. In a big organization, especially in, in corporations, you can't get bogged down in these details. And you can't get into these debates, which are really philosophical or religious, almost religious debates. Um, so you can't get caught in these details because um, as soon as you start getting stuck in the terminology, you hit a brick wall. Uh, most people, especially with corporations don't care whether you're talking about free or open source or floss or you know GPL one, two or three, you know, it's just not something they're interested in. Um, so you need to really find common language. For us open source is working, so when we talk about creative commons or free content or anything else, we talk about open source I mean, people seem to get it. Um, because when you start talking about the technical details, people don't understand. And that's open source just in case uh, you can get it so, <laughs> Then you just start small and create a precedent. Um, you know, that, and fundamentally, when we started this, uh, I made this huge mistake because I went out and I created this proposal, and effectively it was to take all our content and create a licensing it in all different types of licensing. We have a license for this, and for that, and we've got four different types of licenses there that allow different people to do different things. And people look at this and, you know, it's shocked, it's crazy. Um, and everyone went anyway. So we went back from that and we said, okay, let's just start. Uh, doing a little bit, and you know, once you start doing a little bit, people get reassured. They know that you know everything's not going to fall apart. And once you've done a little bit, you can set a precedent for it. We did it like this in the past. This is sort of policy, and you build on it. Um, and then you need to get buy-in. So for us, the buy-in um, was really to get distribution in the U.S. market for all the English. Um, this was really important for us, and. Uh, because we could go and say, listen, we don't get cable, or we've only got cable distribution in two markets in the US, we can reach people online. Um, and one of the best ways is to reach them on YouTube, because, and why YouTube? Because there's an audience there. And let's reach out to this audience. Um, we had Professor Lesser at our Instagram forum last year, delivering a keynote, which also was important to us because we got some of our key executives and people in management to start thinking about this. Um, and finally, the value proposition for us is going with YouTube some of our content up, it was free. We didn't pay for bandwidth or hosting. Um, so, you know, immediately people said, okay, it's not going to cost us anything. So let's go. Um, and what was important when we started this, you know, we started in two different places. One was on our English channel and one was on our Arabic channel. Um, and I always saw what happened in our Arabic channel. And it was really difficult to get by because people didn't see the value of doing this. So eventually what we did was we bought two high-end GCs. We got two interns from university. And they reported the output of our station onto 
on a PDF, cut it up manually, and upload it. Um, and really, to the simple as that, it cost us nothing. Eventually, it cost us two machines and some time, and the interns, time, you know, their interns. And <laughs> <laughs> we, hired, we hired one of them, so a <laughs> full time. But, you know, and eventually, you know, people were shocked when they finally came around and someone said, How do you see this YouTube thing? And, you know, someone said, Chief Editor came around to this room, and it's a small room with all the people hanging around the tables. So it's happening here. You know, we were just shocked that after a small room with these small machines, people were doing this. So that's important when we're building this. Another thing I just thought I'd mention in this book, because I'm not sure if many people have seen it, um, The Starfish and the Spider. And this is really a business book, it's a management book. It's not a book talking about open source philosophy. It's really about if you're a manager, how do you get more out of your organization, how do you get more out of your staff. And what's important about this book, um, from my perspective, is I was given this from one of our senior executives. They said, Mom, have you seen this book? I looked and said, oh, I've seen it in the bookshelf. He said, no, no, you must read it. And I started reading it and, you know, tell the story of Apache and how the Apache uh, project uh, ran Wikipedia, peer-to-peer um, -peer networks. But he was telling me the concepts of business, not, you know, Wikipedia for Wikipedia because it's free and because, you know, it's open culture, but Wikipedia is business strategy and transparency and all these things. So what he did was it made these ideas clear within the business context. And immediately we could start talking about it, even though we didn't try to sell them the philosophy. Um, so this was quite important for us, and you know, so if you have to come to an organization, buy a hundred of these copies and give them out to people. Say, this is the next cool movement like sheet book. Um, okay, so, so next thing then uh, is we need to align to our business needs. Um, and for us again, this was really distribution. Um, and partly distribution to the U.S. and partly just re reaching the youth market. Um, because, you know, as trends are changing, people are not sitting back and watching TV and watching their news, but news, um, especially if they're under 30 anymore, they're getting their news online, so how do we then take the news to them? Um, so once you've created that, you've aligned it to those business needs, you have to prove a strategic value. Um, for us, it's, it, it was very clear after this project started. My colleagues in the English Channel, and this is their YouTube page, and uh, this is one of our hosts in Washington, and she just, they put up a video um, where she started speaking, and this is a hello YouTube, my name is Peter Puffery, and uh, so they, I think this might work with the sound. Okay. No, okay, but well, you can watch it online. Yeah. So, anyway, what, what happened with this video was it went viral on YouTube. Um, over 1.7 million people watched it. And this is a big deal for us because these were 1.7 million people who hadn't seen our channel necessarily before or might have only heard of our channel um, previously, you know, so second or third year information. So, it introduced our channel to a new audience and to new people. Um, so, overall, with, you know, with this project of putting up our videos on YouTube, and we really put up full length programming and full news items. It hasn't just been tasters, but you know, you'll find full 40 minute programs of our best shows online on YouTube. Um, so, it should be every, as much as we could put online, um, with the constraints of how many people we are working with. Um, but it's over 35 million views, and that's only what we've uploaded. There's all sorts of our content and other people have uploaded as well. Um, and it's over nearly approaching 7,000 videos online. So it's really been successful from that point in making this content free. The next step um, that I'm now thinking about and working on is we're well, going free, but we need to now contribute back to the commons. And is there a way we can do that as an organization? Um, we've proved the business value of free, so you know, we need to keep going and move on. Um, and one of the things that we've been working with for Creative Commons is trying to license some of our content under Creative Commons. And this obviously would be a big step. We've got some initial time to do it. Um, and you know, again, it's starting small. Um, but we're really pleased with this. This is the road that we're moving down. Um, now, we're going to start as well about the question of relevancy. And you know, what does it mean to us as in our industry? So when Lawrence Lessig was at our first year forum, um, you know, he's, he started speaking about how you know, we as a news organization um, can try to, you know, Take this, this freedom of speech, this ideal for freedom of speech, and you know, our own quest to get into the US market, and how you know, to win this, we need to go and embrace these ideas, these ideals of freedom of speech, of free content. Um, and one of the things you have to get your content free in some way or another. And you know, we're already on the path to doing that, and we continue doing that, and hopefully, um, for us, you know, we'll, we'll set you know, the standard benchmark in the industry doing this. Finally, so when we talk about relevance, what do you do that's unique? And this really becomes a question when we talk about relevance. What do you do as an organization 
um, that gives you a unique advantage over others. You know, otherwise, you know, if you go to Google's music, you search for a new story, you'll see 200 stories, and they're all just variations on API copy. So what, what makes you unique? And for us, really, as an organization, you know, it's something we call the spirit of the zero. You know, it really makes up who we are. It's a type of reporting that we do, um, which really comes down to telling the truth and telling it in difficult circumstances. You know, we like to think of ourselves as the voice of the South. When we speak about the South, we don't speak about the geographic South, but we speak of cultural, economic, and social South. Um, really giving a voice to the voiceless. And this is one of the important things that informs our reporting, informs our organization. Um, and I just showed this picture for us to remember as an organization. And, you know, if you walk through our offices, you'll see um, a lot of bureaus up into the office looking at some of our journalists who've really um, undergone, you know, some of the the harshest trials in journalism, whether it's been killed in the field or whether it's been, you know, we just had a cameraman that was released from Guantanamo after seven years, and just before I left, I saw him walking in the corridors, and he's been out about two months since he's been released. Now, a shop, you know, I came out to seven years ago, I've spent my time in the spa, not back in the office. But this is just this commitment to journalism and a commitment to telling the truth. Um, so, this picture is just, you know, it's a famous picture, you might have seen it where one of our journalists helped present that Tariq Ayyub was killed in Iraq um, by themselves, you know. And it's really for us to remember that as an organization, this is where we come from. We we're really trying to tell the story and we keep on telling them. So, that's it. Those are my contacts if you need to get in touch. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be here for much longer, so please drop me an email. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to get in touch. Um, just to, you know, for you to give me some ideas of what we're doing and how we can do it better. Thank you.